Good afternoon. Um, today, the council is going to vote on the following finance items. Three pre-considered resolutions amending the property tax rates for fiscal year 2019. We're going to be restating and amending the property tax rates that were set in June to implement state legislation, lowering the class share cap from 5% to 0.5%. And then uh, introduction. Uh, 1144, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, uh, at the request of the mayor, is going to authorize 14 business improvement districts' bids across the city to increase their annual bid assessments. There are going to be two pre-considered resolutions, setting uh, November 28th at 10 a.m. as the date and time for a public hearing to consider a local law to establish the Throgs Neck bid in Councilmember Jonai's district and a local law to expand and increase the annual assessment of the Hudson Square bid in my council district. The council will vote on the following land use items. Uh, 2050 Bartow Avenue, it's the approval of a site selection for a full service animal adoption center and veterinary medical clinic in council member Andy King's district. Uh, I know this was challenging uh, for Councilmember King uh, to make sure that we balance the citywide need for an animal shelter uh, in the Bronx with local concerns, but I think he struck that balance and his community will benefit from a significant set of investments he was able to secure. I'm personally very, very excited about this. I've uh, been on this for a long time, so I'm really glad the Bronx is finally getting uh, an animal shelter. Uh, here are the other uh, land use items, 599 uh, Cortland. It is a, a small uh, development in Councilmember Salamanca's district, the chair of our land use committee. St. Michael's Park rezoning in Councilmember Constantinidis district. Uh, an amendment to the Coney Island Amusement Park Special Process Agreement in Councilmember Traeger's district. Hebrew home for the aged. It's gonna be an uh, independent senior living facility in Councilmember Andy Cohen's district in Riverdale. And here are the pieces of legislation we're voting on today. Introduction 1133A, sponsored by Councilmember Adrian Adams, would codify into the charter the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, MODA, 
The office uses analytics tools to prioritize risk more strategically, deliver services more efficiently, enforce laws more effectively, and increase transparency. And if Councilmember Adams comes, she can speak on this. Councilmember uh, Introduction uh, 376B, sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres, would require the Department of Youth and Community Development to conduct outreach to youth about the availability of bullying awareness and prevention resources. The bill would also require the Department of Education to distribute information about an online portal through which students and their parents may report bullying, harassment, intimidation, or discrimination. Councilmember Torres can't join us today. Um, next, we're gonna vote on the uh, series of four hire vehicle bills. Introduction 304A, sponsored by our Transportation Committee Chair, Donis Rodriguez, would establish a taxi medallion task force. The task force would review the changes in sales prices and medallions, potential future sales prices, and the impact on the city's budget. Following the review, the task force would recommend relevant changes in laws, rules, regulations, and policies. And I invite uh, Chair Rodriguez to speak on this bill. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, no doubt that everyone has seen how many yellow taxi drivers they've been committed suicide because they cannot handle it with the crisis. The crisis that didn't happen overnight, but the city sold the promise to the industry that they will be the one having the exclusive right to pick up and drop out on the street. And that industry has been suffering, but most important, there's 6,000 individual medallion owners that they got into loan more to get the mortgage to buy the houses. They got into loan to send the kids to college. And they have seen how they, the value of the medallion have been going, losing a, a, a value every day. So I think it's important to think about, uh, for the moment, how the yellow taxi is an icon image of our city. There is no New York City without yellow taxi. I believe that ensuring the financial success of this industry that has become synonymous, synonymous with our city is the almost important, and as the chairman of the, of the Committee of Transportation, uh, I will continue working with my colleague, Chairman Dia for the Fort Ohio Committee, and Speaker Johnson, everyone, to bring some solutions to the life of those 15,000, but most important, the 6,000 individual medallions owners whose value of those medallions are disappearing every day in our city. That financial success is, increase, uh, is increasing under the threat of medallion prices continue to decline, threatening not only the yellow cap industry, but our city transportation network and as a whole, and losing 100,000 and millions of dollars every year to our revenue because we have not been able to stabilize the prices of the yellow taxi medallions. The loss of value not only decreased, the strain of our city resources, but also decrease the value of the investments of so many in our city. By creating this independent task force, they, the members will be uh, assigned to study and come back with recommendation on how we need to deal and bring some solution to the crisis or the loss of value of the yellow taxi medal in our city. Hoy lo, le damos la gracia al Speaker Johnson, a todos los concejales aquí, por ayudarnos a pasar una resolución que lo que busca es tratar de buscar solución a algo que afecta a todo el mundo, pero especialmente a los inmigrantes. La mayoría de las personas que manejan los taxis nuestros son inmigrantes, la mayoría de la parte South Asian, y nosotros esperamos de nuevo de que con la, el task force que estamos construyendo hoy, creando hoy, vamos a darle seis meses para que ellos hagan el estudio y vengan para acá, para atrás con las recomendaciones necesarias que nos permitan a nosotros buscar solución a una crisis que le está quitando la vida a muchos de ellos cometiendo suicidio. Thank you. Uh, we just spoke about Councilmember Adams' bill on the Mayor's Office on Data Analytics, and I want to invite her up to speak on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon. I'm very excited to um, announce uh, the passage or 
hopeful passage of intro 1197. This is, as they say, common sense legislation. This bill would codify into the charter of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. The Mayor's Office of Data Analytics is New York City's Civic Intelligence Center, allowing the city to aggregate and analyze data from across city agencies to more effectively address crime, public safety, and quality of life issues. The office uses analytics tools to prioritize risk more strategically, deliver services more efficiently, enforce laws more effectively, and increase transparency, something that we all need and want these days. The office's core functions include collaboration with the city agencies to implement data-driven solutions to city service delivery issues, building a citywide data platform to facilitate data sharing, oversight of citywide data projects, and implementation of the city's open data law. The objective information received from this office is a valuable tool for the New York City Council and helps us to be more robust in our work. While the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics was created by Executive Order 306 under Mayor Michael Bloomberg, we must ensure that this office survives successive mayoral administrations. And I'm very excited about the vote this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And we spoke before you walked in, Councilmember King, about the uh, Bartow site and your district and the animal shelter. And I said how hard you've worked on this to negotiate a deal for your community. So I want to invite you up to speak on this. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, and administration. Um, this was a challenging, one of those challenging um, things that we in government have to negotiate and figure out how to make sure we're responsible as elected leaders in our communities to deliver on making sure whatever laws we get passed that we execute them effectively and efficiently. While some folks in the 12th district were not 100% happy, um, the 12th district um, didn't walk away with a victory and the Bronx walked away with a victory or we were able to comply with the law. So again, I wanna thank everyone who made this a possibility. I uh, know our animals have, will have a place to be taken care of just like we have hospitals to take care of human beings. So they are, for many of us, our animals, our pets are our best friends. So this is one case that I think we all can walk away with a smile. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. And I like those Crocs. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Jeff Colton pointed them out earlier. <laughs> uh, next, uh, we're going to uh, discuss introduction 1062A, sponsored by Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, uh, which would require drivers uh, for her high volume for her vehicle services to be paid for trips even when the payment transaction fails. For example, because the payment provider does not complete the transaction, I want to invite uh, Barry up to discuss this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you all. Uh, it's very simple. Um, my district, I have many, many people who drive both yellow cabs and Uber and the other uh, for higher services. And um, through anecdotal evidence and uh, through visits from these uh, drivers, we have found that many of them were getting stiffed um, in some cases out of a lot of money because they would drive somebody, pick somebody up in Midtown Manhattan, take them to JFK or LaGuardia, and then the credit card is no good. And so uh, what this bill will do, uh, will make them whole, will prevent that from happening. It's a very, very simple remedy, um, and it uh, will enable uh, many New Yorkers to have a larger paycheck uh, at the end of every week. So. I want to thank the speaker. I want to thank uh, the transportation chair as well. Um, and I'm very excited for the people who live in my district that will benefit from this. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Berry. And uh, next is introduction 1068A, which is by Councilmember Steve Levin, which will require the Taxi and Limousine Commission and the Department of Consumer Affairs to engage in financial outreach and education to taxi and for her vehicle drivers. She can't be here. Uh, following that, introduction 1079A, sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards, would create the Office of Inclusion within the Taxi Limousine Commission. We spoke about this during the summer. Councilmember Richards was uh, very thoughtful and quick when we were discussing uh, the issues surrounding Uber uh, and uh, serious past and current instances of discrimination, folks not being picked up uh, on the streets because of their uh, skin color. Uh, and Councilmember Richard said, we need to do something structurally uh, about this. This office would compile and report statistics relating to driver demographics and discrimination against passengers and address issues relating to racism and discrimination in the taxi and for hire vehicle industries. So we've been talking about this since the summer. I'm really, really glad we're doing this. We should have done this a long time ago. So I want to invite Councilmember Richards up. 
Thank you, and I'm proud to be here to speak about uh, Intro 1079, which is the creation uh, of the TLC's Office of Inclusion. Listen, there's no legislation that will serve as a cure-all for decades of denied rights and bias. And it's sad that we need to even create this office in 2018, but I'm happy that we are moving forward uh, today in a better direction. The new Office of Inclusion will report on driver demographics, discrimination against passengers, examine and address issues related to discrimination in the industry, develop policies and best practices to encourage greater representation of diverse drivers and develop trainings to promote cultural sensitivity, among many other responsibilities. It, was, it will also be tasked with assessing the feasibility of a driver-to-driver -driver mentorship and cultural awareness program, program expanding public awareness around ride refusals, providing a mechanism to submit complaints directly to the TLC while also ensuring complaints are addressed and serving as a resource with people uh, with disabilities. At the end of the day, uh, we're all just trying to get to work or school and get home to our families and friends, and we shouldn't be denied uh, that based on the color of our skin. Everyone attempting to use a taxi service deserves to be treated with the same respect, no matter what their race, gender, disability, or home borough is. It is my expectation that this office will help us achieve that standard. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson, uh, Legislative Council James Dia Giovanni, and I want to especially thank Jason Goldman, who really uh, was helpful in, in moving this uh, along. Also, my legislative director, Jordan Gibbons, for all their work to help to bring this Office of Inclusion to uh, fruition. Thank you. Thanks, Speaker. Thanks, Donovan. Thank you. Uh, next, introduction uh, 1081A, sponsored by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca, would require the Taxi and Limousine Commission to provide assistance to drivers, including mental health counseling, financial counseling, and referrals to outside organizations for additional assistance. He'll speak about this, but you saw many of the um, issues that cropped up and the suicides, tragic suicides we saw, was because of people being in distress and we want to provide resources to individuals who are struggling and for them to know what resources are available. So I'm going to invite Councilmember Salamanca to come up and discuss this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Intro uh, 1081 is a direct response to the recent tr uh, tragedies uh, of the six New York City taxi drivers uh, which committed suicide this past year. For months, the City Council debated the merits around the ride sharing but one of the unintended consequences was just how severe these financial, emotional, and physical burdens would be on the drivers themselves. Many of the taxi drivers were and are immigrants looking to provide for their families. They are hardworking people working long hours to barely make enough to live on. And as you'll find in any job, they are stressors. But the incredible, incredibly isolated nature of their job Familiar pressures and financial troubles were a particularly dangerous combination. The stigma around mental health illness is very real, and it cannot be understated just how important it is to not only bring awareness around it, but also encourage people to seek out and receive the help that they need. By requiring the Taxi and Limousine Commission to provide their licensed drivers assistance with financial counseling, mental health, and more, my hope is that thousands of taxi drivers can finally gain some relief and know that there is help for them. This bill is for all cab drivers in New York who have been suffering in silence, not knowing that they are going to pay their debt, feed their family, or keep a roof over their head. One life lost to utter despair and hopeless is one too many. Today's message is our city is our city's way of, of taking action and doing something positive about it. I appreciate the support of the speaker and my colleagues, and I thank them for helping me pass this bill today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Rafael. Uh, next, introduction uh, 1096A, sponsored by Fort Hare Vehicle Committee's Chair Ruben Diaz Sr. would require high volume Fort Hare Vehicle Services as part of their new licensing requirement to affirm that they will not administer any automatic deductions for vehicle payments from driver pay unless the deduction is optional and chosen by the driver. Uh, Chair Diaz is not here. And finally, in recognition of Veterans Day, the council will vote on several bills, all sponsored by 
Councilmember Eric Ulrich that would create uh, resources and services for our city's veterans. Our veterans have sacrificed nearly everything for our country and we will continue to do so and, and will continue to do so for generations to come. We owe it to them to ensure that they're taken care of and to make sure that we as a city are doing everything we can to protect them. Introduction 391A would require the Department of Veterans Services to provide benefits counseling services to veterans seeking assistance with federal, state, and city benefits that they may be entitled to based on their military service. The Department of Veterans Services would be required to provide counseling services in one location in each borough and at a newly and at each newly created Veterans Resource Center. Introduction 394A would require the department to create official Veterans Resource Centers in each borough no later than June 1st, 2019 to provide benefits counseling services. Additionally, DVS would be required to provide a minimum of 20 hours of in-field and office service to veterans in each borough per week. And introduction 396A would require the department to increase a veterans, to create a veterans resource guide with information on benefits available to veterans and their family members, laws affording special rights and privileges to veterans, protections and remedies given to veterans <coughs> under the New York City human rights laws, available physical and mental health programs and resources, educational and training opportunities, and available sources of low or no cost legal assistance. Uh, Councilmember Orange is not here, but I want to congratulate him. And that concludes our uh, agenda for today's stated meeting. And I'm happy to take, we're all happy to take uh, on topic questions on all the bills and issues on the calendar today. Rich. Uh, I won't be on the other bills. And the rest sure. Of the no problem. Um, I yeah. So I, I, I want to. I'm happy to let uh, Councilmember King speak on this. Of course, I'll just say generally, you know, uh, community boards very, very frequently uh, oppose uh, land use applications at the beginning of the process, and it changes over the course of Euler from when the community board sees it to what ends up at the city council. That's really the process is about the negotiation and figuring out what can do to make the project beneficial for the community. That happens with every project. My community board opposes a lot of things, but when it gets to the council, typically they're in a better place but Councilmember King can speak about this directly yeah and you know just piggyback on what the speaker said day one there was a conversation of just presenting an animal shelter the community board voted to support an animal shelter just not at that location right. however after the conversation changed and other things were added to in addition to the neighborhood before I even came down and said I was going to support and vote, I brought all this conversation back to the neighborhood, back to the district managers, back to board members, and there was those who were emphatically saying no. So you know what? I, I can live with an animal shelter if we're going to get our youth center, something that the community has been fighting for, for for decades and years. So, you know, there was a change of heart, and that's how we are today. There was nothing. It was just the animal shelter. That was the only thing that was on the table, animal shelter. By day five of the conversation, there was animal shelter, youth center, beacon programs, senior breakfast program, traffic issues, rezoning issues. So there was a host of things that the neighborhood needed that were gonna be taken care of um, as the conversation moved forward. So that's how we're out of yesterday. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Anything else on these bills, Brian? Yeah, so on the No, there's another, I think, important um, uh, package of bills that we're still working on, and we're working with the TLC and the individual members on those three bills uh, that still we hope to get done, uh, if not by the end of this year, hopefully the beginning of next year, is a uh, debt bill, uh, reviewing the debt that has been created or uh, that has accumulated for uh, medallion owners. That's number one. That has been one of the major, I think, drivers of this crisis, the debt that uh, individual medallion owners are dealing with and the financial stress 
that's impacting people on that. Leasing regulations, you know, there have been some predatory leasing companies that put folks in a very difficult position. One of those companies that's been talked about in the press, uh, we're looking at practices there and what legal authority we have to be looking at uh, leasing regulations in the city. And the third is the uh, health benefits fund uh, for drivers who right now may not be able to get the coverage that they need uh, for health insurance and other medical benefits. Uh, that is something that went through litigation. The TLC tried to do it on their own without council legislation. A court struck it down saying it could only be done through legislation at the council. That's a bill that council member Lander and I have been working on for a few years now and we're making progress. So I think those are three more significant bills that the council's still working on, but all three of them were slightly more complicated than the great bills that we're voting on today, which is why they weren't part of this package. Both. Jill? On the, on the taxi bills as well, just maybe in terms of what these mental health centers, like how, how they'll work, where they see them, just the physical places you can go to go, and maybe some of the things you talked to them, and how, how will it all work? Yeah, so um, basically the, the taxi drivers who may have some type of financial um, um, burden or they may have some type of health or mental burden, they can go to TLC, they'll assign certain locations, but they'll be working. The goal is to work with not-for-profits to get them the help that they need, especially for the mental health component. Brian, I was wrong. It's just for our vehicles, not yellows on the leasing. Yep. Anyone <laughs> else on any of these? Okay, off topic. Will. I love how this question is prefaced. Uh, would you, uh, Unimaginable. <laughs> would you, uh, engage it's good to see you too, Will. <laughs> would you engage the city council representatives and some of your colleagues uh, in negotiation with a multi-billion dollar company? I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to put together hypothetical uh, questions, but I think what you're getting at is should the council have been involved in the Amazon deal that was announced yesterday? And I have um, very significant concerns about the process <laughs> that took place. Uh, you know, as speaker of this body, but I think any member would attest to this, whether it's in their district or not, we have a land use process. That land use process is there for transparency, for negotiation, for community engagement, uh, for public review. Um, it was codified through the 1989 Charter Revision Commission uh, for real reasons, to provide that level of transparency to the public and at every level of government. And so I have real issues with it not going through ULERP, number one. I have real issues with the level of subsidy involved. Uh, and I think we have to have a conversation about the state subsidy that's been put on the table, as well as the, the uh, non-discretionary city subsidy dollars through REAP and the, some of the other programs. Are those necessary programs uh, through the Federal Opportunity Zone? Should Long Island City be included in the Federal Opportunity Zone, or does it not need to be extended to Long Island City anymore? I think this opens up a much bigger conversation, and it's a conversation that I think many of us would have been like to have been included in, uh, and we still want to be included in it. The council is uh, a legislative, the municipal legislature of this city with uh, serious charter mandated powers with regard to land use and oversight, and we take those powers seriously, both as a body and as individuals whose districts this may occur in. So uh, I think the process itself uh, has not been a good process. It was cloaked in secrecy. Uh, and I think that is why you're seeing uh, folks on the left, the right, and in the center push back. When you have the, the New York Post editorial board and National Review agreeing with our, our good new member of Congress, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and the New York Times opinion writers on this, there is clearly outrage related to the process and the potential pitfalls that we're seeing related to how this came together.
real estate uh, and companies in an area where you know large local wind farms are really big. Is well, there are some points where you're necessary to open up? It, it, it depends. I can't say broadly. It depends on the individual site. If it's a site that involves public land, which this site does, that comes into the Euler process. So of course, it involves public land. It involves uh, city resources and dollars. I mean, what I read yesterday related to pilot payments, uh, where there's going to be payment in lieu of taxes going to an infrastructure fund for the surrounding community and neighborhood. I mean, the council has um, oversight on things like that, and we need to look at that. So in this specific instance, yes, I do think we should have played a role and we should still play a role. I can't speak about other hypothetical situations. Willie? Well, we're still uh, looking at it. Uh, we're still looking at <laughs> what exactly is entailed here. The MOU is um, very detailed, and we have our staff here uh, reviewing that. It's my understanding that this may uh, trigger review uh, by the Public Authorities Control Board, uh, which right now is made up of appointees from the governor, the speaker, and the majority leader. Um, that is the review board that looked at uh, the West Side Stadium in the past, uh, where which was supposed to take place where Hudson Yards is now being developed. So there's going to be, I think, some opportunity to testify there. But of course, I think going on right now, or happened just an hour ago, Councilmember Van Bramer and State Senator Janaris uh, were having a rally in their district to talk about the issues that they have. I think we're all still trying to digest this uh, and understand what the full implications are. And that's going to take some review by us and review from independent folks like the Citizens Budget Commission and the Independent Budget Office and other folks who are going to look at this and then we'll evaluate our options. Katie? Uh, also about Amazon. Um, last year when the city was clearing its plan, there were a lot of elected officials who signed letters of support for the plan, including Councilman Van Bramer and, and State Senator Metinaris, a bunch of city council members. Do you think that the city just didn't fully I didn't sign that letter. You did not. I just guessed before I asked. Um, the speaker did not sign for the record. But for, I guess, other people, they want to chime in or if they want to, I mean, I, I know the, the city did kept things very secret in terms of the bid, but um, was there any idea of the level of corporate subsidies that would be given? Um, maybe this isn't the right question because you didn't sign it. No, I mean, what happens very regularly, this is no state secret, that you know, the administration on a very regular basis reaches out to council members to ask members to sign letters and put their names on press releases and to support a particular uh, policy that's being unveiled at a press conference. And um, sometimes, and I don't say this in a critical way of the great members here, because I've done it myself, sometimes you, you're moving around, you're moving too quickly, you think, oh, it sounds okay, you put your name on it without knowing the full implications. And I think a year ago, when the city was making a bid for Amazon, no one understood the level of corporate subsidy that was going to be involved. No one contemplated ULERP uh, being uh, uh, totally avoided uh, and there being a runaround on that. No one understood how the pilot program was going to be set up. No one understood the public land that was going to be at play. No one understood all of these other issues that we're now learning about in the last 24 hours. So I think there's a lot of members of this body and potentially uh, at other levels of government who may have signed that letter without having all the details who now have serious questions. I didn't sign it. Council Richards didn't sign it. I know. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm <laughs> <laughs> you signed it? I signed it. Yeah. I'm not an Amazon customer. I want to make that clear. Okay. <laughs> but I, if I could pick up on something. You know, the problem with the secrecy is after everything is said and done and there are overcrowded schools and the trains are clogged and the streets need fixing, and the parks and every other thing that we expect from municipal government and we deliver $89 billion a year worth of services, it's gonna be the local council member, whether it's in that area or another part of New York City, who's gonna be left to pick up the pieces of a deal that he or she was not involved in. And that is a fundamental question that we have to answer, not just at a city level, but also at a state level. We can't be expected to deliver things um, when we weren't at the table crafting a solution. Monday was saying the city wouldn't give in any subsidies, but clearly that's not true. 
private building. Do you think the mayor has misled the Northern Zone residents when he said one thing when in reality they told him three billion that they really cut was coming from the city planning department? Well, it's complicated because those are subsidies and programs that anyone could have qualified for. So they weren't given out in a discretionary way to Amazon. I think it creates the much bigger conversation do some of these subsidy programs still need to exist? Do we still need uh, uh, subsidy programs to encourage uh, large commercial development in the outer boroughs where it's potentially already happening? You've seen many people say Google came here. They're one of the biggest employers in my district and they're expanding. They're taking more and more and more office space near Chelsea Market uh, without any level of subsidy. Same with Facebook and other tech companies. So it's a conversation that we need to uh, have but I think all the details matter on the infrastructure fund related to uh, the, the pilot program that we saw yesterday. And there were two other major sites uh, adjacent to the Amazon site. There was the Plaxel site to the south and a city-owned site that went through an RFP, a TF Cornerstone site with a Department of Education <laughs> building that's used to prepare meals for uh, kids in New York City. Those two sites were separately in pre-certification about to go into ULERP sometime soon, and there was gonna be a community conversation in Long Island City with the council member and community board and borough president. What I'm reading is they folded those two large-scale sites into the general project plan so that there's no ULERP, not just on the Amazon site, but these two other sites that were being contemplated next to it, where the council member has been having conversations for years about those sites. So that is an issue. I mean, I, I, I think it is, I think that the governor and the mayor uh, had really good intentions. They were trying to do something that had economic impact uh, and, and opportunity for the city of New York. But I feel like most of the cities, and especially us as finalists, I think is something's fundamentally wrong when you're giving this much money away and public land away and it is cloaked in secrecy. No one in city government should be signing uh, secrecy agreements where they can't discuss a deal that involves billions of public dollars and public land where there's no review on it. I mean, that is why we have checks and balances. That's why we have a legislature. That's why we have different levels of government. That didn't happen here. And I think that's why you've seen the pushback because people weren't able to participate in a conversation and feel bought in to what the deal was gonna be. If this had come out, maybe Amazon wouldn't have come, maybe they would have come. I don't think they're coming here just because of the subsidy. We saw last night different states release that uh, Pennsylvania said they were willing to give, I think, $7 billion in subsidy. Uh, Tennessee was gonna give billions of dollars. There were other states that were offering subsidy. They're coming here because we're New York. They're coming here because we are New York City. We have the highest number of talent. We have housing. We have access to transportation. We have all these things. And then there are other issues related to what is this gonna do to the rents in the surrounding neighborhoods? What's it gonna do for displacement and gentrification? There are many issues that are still at play and we haven't had the opportunity to review those things. So now we're gonna start asking those questions. Gloria. No, I, no, no, I don't know that. I had a very brief conversation uh, with the mayor in Puerto Rico uh, where he mentioned to me that this was a possibility, but we didn't get into details and he was giving me a heads up, but you know, there was no, I didn't know the, the amount of subsidy. I didn't know kind of the, about Plaxel and the pilot program and the TF Cornerstone site. And I didn't know any of that. And so, um, I asked for some numbers and analysis to understand um, whatever the city was given, how was it going to come back to us years from now to economically benefit um, the city. And then yesterday I had a previously scheduled meeting uh, with James Patchett, the president of EDC, on other topics, and we spoke about this uh, briefly at that meeting. It was before the announcement happened yesterday. It was yesterday morning. So I still haven't gotten a full in-depth briefing, slide by slide, point by point, number by number on what's gonna happen, but uh, clearly you've seen pushback from members of the state legislature. 
You've seen pushback and concern from members of this body, especially the local council member, and it's a conversation we have to have. Jeff? We're, we're still contemplating it. We're, I have ideas, but we're, uh, we're still contemplating what, um, it's a conversation that we have to have collectively, and we haven't had the opportunity to have that conversation yet. I haven't had the opportunity to sit one-on-one -on -one with Council Member Van Bramer. He just got back yesterday from Puerto Rico, and he had this rally today, so I'll see him in a little while. Um, at the stated meeting, but it's a conversation that we have to have and we have folks here reviewing what the levels of um, uh, approval are moving forward. I think one new piece of information is the Public Authorities Control Board uh, because there are capital grants uh, involved here at the tune of you know half a billion dollars, $500 million from the state. So there are gonna be other opportunities for the council to participate, though I still uh, cannot defend and do not support avoiding our charter mandated ULIP process. Rich. I don't want to go there yet, but I just want to. I, I want to say that we're 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 still reviewing it. You know, we are the staff wasn't involved in this. We're reviewing our options. Wait, what did he say, Rich? I didn't hear what you said. He said that he's going to do pretty much just a hard bargain with Amazon and that uh, the plan has all sorts of requests for subsidies. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems pretty clear from the deal that there were not any new subsidies that were created in a non-discretionary <laughs> way from the city, uh, but the pilot program for infrastructure, um, you know, that in some way is not the best precedent to set all the time because it means they're not paying taxes, which small businesses pay taxes. Well, he basically said he's going to do just a hard bargain. I don't know enough about it. What I'm saying is I still haven't gotten briefed on this fully and neither is the staff here. But again, what I said is the, the level of corporate subsidy is something that I am not in favor of. And I'm not sure it was necessary to actually attract Amazon here. I think Amazon was playing every city off of each other when maybe from the beginning of the process, there were you know over 150 or 200 cities that wanted to vie for this. There are very few cities that are as attractive as New York and just outside of Washington, D.C. because of the talent pool and the number of folks are here. The other thing is 25,000 jobs, yes. Up to 40,000 jobs, yes. That's a good thing. Um, we want jobs. Nicole Gelinas uh, pointed out yesterday that uh, if you look at the economic expansion over the last 10 years since the Great Recession happened in 2008, over the course of the last 10 years, 700,000 jobs have been created in New York City. So 25,000 jobs out of 700,000, I think is around 4%. So in a city of Seattle, which is less than a million people, a huge chunk of jobs like that is very meaningful for the economy. But in a city that already has over four million private sector jobs on its own, that's created 700,000 new jobs over the last 10 years, it's hard to quantify how big of a deal 25,000 jobs is. Um, and as she pointed out, as Nicole pointed out in her piece, this is not the 1970s. You know, we, there are plenty of companies that want to come here anyway, that are coming here anyway, that want to be in New York City because the talent that we have and because what our city is. So I think those are all questions we need to ask. Summer? Well, we got their fares. I mean, I think there are other issues that I hope we're gonna be able to work on together that the city and state will work on together. I think there's a long state legislative agenda 
uh, and then at the top of that is the MTA and funding the fast forward plan, uh, which means looking at congestion pricing uh, and a series of other potential revenue streams that could fund that. Um, you know, the mayor and governor, I think, yesterday showed they can work together. Um, and uh, I look forward to hopefully working with both of them on all of the issues that, have fa that, that the city and state face as well, and everyone in this body looks forward to participating in that conversation. So what, what exactly are the priorities that the Lowry is trying to pay off in terms of this company-wide arrangement as opposed to the supply chain for bringing in people? I think that their intentions here were good intentions. I don't think that the mayor or governor were doing this for some weird, nefarious reason. I think both of them believe that this is a good thing for the city and the state, and that is why they did this. I think that there are other people, like myself and folks here and other folks that have criticized it, who are skeptical about the level of money involved and really think that this uh, is a process that uh, really kind of stinks, you know? It's not a process that has engaged other folks in a meaningful way and has been transparent. So I think that there are those concerns, and uh, I do hope, though, and I'm a, I don't think people compartmentalize things. I think people look at something and they're not thinking, if we do this, we could be getting this money for the MTA and other things. You know, uh, let's hope a recession doesn't come anytime soon, um, because $3 billion is a lot of money, uh, and we have very significant needs in New York City. The mayor's talked about the housing crisis we faced since he ran for mayor. We wanna create more housing, especially uh, low-income housing and housing for people who are currently homeless, and those are things we're gonna push on. Yes? So do you think the MTA that has an obligation to Bayland could work for the city and state to come? I'm not saying I don't want Amazon to come. I'm saying there needs to be a process. If public land is involved, if public dollars are involved, there needs to be a, a public review process that has a conversation around that. We're happy to have Amazon uh, come here if they wanna come here. I mean, I have concerns about how they've treated workers in the past and their labor records, uh, but you know, we wanna create more jobs here. We just think that there needs to be an open and transparent process. Yes, sir. It's not an Amazon question for you, but I'm on. Sure. Um, Honestly, I, I don't know enough about it, um, but I'm happy to get back to you. Was it, whose district was it in? Council? It was in Andy Cohen's district. It was Andy Cohen's district. Well, I'm happy to, to look at it and get back to you. I, I don't know enough about it. Jeff? to understand legally what that means. There is a consent decree, so the federal judge upheld the consent decree. I think Judge Pauly, who the judge who was looking at this, has been pretty critical of NYCHA and has talked about the importance of the consent decree. So I would have to look a little bit more. I didn't know anything about this. The judge uh, did approve it. It was the consent decree was in the settlement proposal. Yes. Right? And he wouldn't sign off. Wouldn't sign yeah, I mean, that's not surprising given all the uh, NYCHA residents who showed up at that hearing from across the city and also the open back and forth that uh, the district court judge had with uh, NYCHA about the continuing concerns in place. So I don't think it's very surprising. What about the I think that's probably what Judge Pauly is, is looking at, yeah. Really? Well, luckily, I get to be public advocate soon. <laughs> For 45 days, I get to be acting public advocate, which means I get to open up the hood of that truck and look inside and see what's going on. And so at the end of those 45 days, I'll report back. Can you work for the division? No. <laughs> Jill. Yeah. Not setting aside time. It's more than one full-time job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any of these people have more than this is a. We have been contemplating uh, since the primary 
uh, what this uh, council is going to do over the course of those 45 days with the Public Advocate's Office, which means that some professional staff here are gonna come up with um, potential ideas and um, to look at the office uh, and try to understand if there are better ways uh, to improve things. I think Tish James has done a great job as public advocate, um, so this is not being critical of her. It's just to have a kind of deeper conversation and to look at the office as a whole. And so I want to kind of reserve judgment until I have the opportunity to do that, but I am continuing to spend days here uh, at the council and not at the municipal building over those 45 days, but we're gonna make sure that there are good folks. Uh, technically, I am the acting public advocate, uh, but that we're gonna make sure that there are good folks that are uh, shepherding and uh, being good stewards of that office over the course of those 45 days. Jill? Hell, hell, no. <laughs> You should, uh, you know, take the E train or the 7 train to Court Square and uh, and get off. You know, we're just there just to list and, and like, you know, if there might be a like piece of wood and perhaps not being aware of it. If he has child-aged children, I would recommend any of the best schools. Far, far, <laughs> far Rockaway is far definitely Rockaway open. Is nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. that, was that was a joke. Anything else you want? <laughs> anything else you want to say, Barry? That's enough, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Gloria? I don't have an update. There have been uh, conversations uh, related to this. And again, I think I said this when I was first asked about it earlier this year. I don't remember which month, May or June, um, here at one of these press conferences that um, fundamentally, if you look at what happened to our friend and colleague, Debbie Rose, which she had to deal with a politically motivated prosecution for more than six years, with ended, which ended in all charges being dismissed uh, and the special prosecutor involved ended up making more than a half a million dollars off of the case, and she got charged with nothing, but was left, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but was left with a gigantic amount of uh, legal bills, which now she doesn't really have a mechanism to pay off, or it would take years to pay off with the $50 limit that Coib talked about. I think this is an unregulated, uncharted area that we want to look at in a responsible way to figure out what is a uh, thoughtful framework to set up for any person in elected office, not just two folks like the mayor and Debbie who are still having to deal with legal bills, but anyone who runs into this in the future, and that's what we're trying to strike the balance on. No. No, I don't think the mayor. No, and in the few conversations I've had with the mayor, he's never raised Councilmember Rose in those conversations. So I don't think the mayor is doing that or trying to use that. I think, you know, the Coib opinion that came back and said fifty dollars. They said in the opinion the council can legislate this. So. Um, I think it's an area that we should look at and try to set up a responsible framework that strikes the balance between letting folks uh, pay for legal bills they may accumulate, while at the exact same time um, doesn't allow um, large amounts of money to enter the system through another way. Last Will? Is it really the role of the taxpayer to bail out the politicians who are in this business uh, who happen to have uh, run afoul of prosecutors? Uh, we're talking about not taxpayers. The Legal Defense Fund will be privately raised. Okay. It wouldn't be taxpayers. Anyone else? Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.